it's, it's very easy to assume that we all experience the world the same way. You're wearing a, a kind of mauve purple shirt and a, and a blue shirt, and it seems like that's out there in the world. Those colors are out there in the world. They're not being made up in my head. But that's not true. We don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. So there's some classic studies about the effect of language that native Russian speakers distinguish more shades of blue. So these categories are imposed in a slightly different way. If we see things in a different way, then we're talking about two different realities. Yeah. In a sense. I've been fond of saying that our experience is like a controlled hallucination. We have these social media echo chambers, but we also have to some extent perceptual echo chambers too. You know, we all live in different inner world, unique inner worlds, and we'll probably seek out perceptual information to reinforce the way we encounter the world, even at these, these lowest levels. You know, what's out there? Who knows? Ask a physicist. But the way we experience it is always coming from the inside out. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is a professor of neuroscience at the University of Sussex and the author of a best-selling book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness. Anil Seth, welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, before we get into the main interview, tell everybody a little bit about who you are, obviously a neuroscientist, but how are you where you are? What has been the journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us? I've always been interested in one of these, I think, fundamental mysteries, which is this mystery of consciousness. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a mystery that even before you put a name to it, appears when, when we're all kids, like, who am I? Why am I me and not somebody else? Where was I before I was born? What happens to me? after I die. And then as I, as I got older, these, that basic question evolved into deeper questions, like how is it possible that this lump of electrified pate inside my head can give rise to an experience, you know, the, an experience of the world, the redness of red, the, the pang of, of an emotional experience, uh, the sense of free will. And it's not that I set out with this plan to be an academic researching this stuff. I just kind of never lost interest in it and gradually wound my way through different disciplines at university and, and afterwards studying psychology and physics and then computer science. And uh, by about 20 years ago, when I'd finished my PhD, around that time, the study of consciousness was, was coming back onto the radar in academia, in neuroscience, in psychology, in philosophy. And so I was lucky to, to get a position back at University of Sussex. I went, I, I did my PhD there. I went to America for a few years, California, and came back and, and started a group trying to understand how the brain works, but specifically trying to understand this big question of how and why we experience the world and the self the way we do, and also what applications this understanding can have for for medicine, for mental health and neurology, for, for technology, how we develop and interact with, with AI, and, and also for society as a whole. You know, understanding how we perceive the world and how we perceive ourselves, I think, has a lot of implications for society in general. So that's kind of how I got. Well, yeah, well, it sounds like you've you taken like a childhood passion and just kept going until you became quite uh, successful in that field. And, and that's why it's interesting to have you on. So what is consciousness? People will disagree. For me, it's very simple. We all know what consciousness is. It's what goes away when you fall into a dreamless sleep or go under general anesthesia, which have you, have you done that? Have you been under general yes. anesthesia? So you know, it's yeah. like, it's completely different from sleep, isn't it? I mean, you, mm. you have no idea how much time has passed. S certainly the times I've had general, you, you go under, you come back and you're not just sort of dozing, you were just not there. It could be 10 years later. It could be 10 years laugh, later. Yeah. And it's that, it's that oblivion. That's, it's, um, that is unconsciousness. And yes. the flip side of that is, is consciousness. So when that's not happening, you, you are conscious. The, the philosopher Tom, Thomas Nagel puts it, I think very nicely. He says, for a conscious organism, there is something it is like to be that organism. Like it feels like something to be you or me, probably, many animals, it feels like something to be that animal, but for, for you under general anesthesia or for a table or a chair, 
there's nothing going on. There's no subjective experience going on at all. So that's consciousness. So, but see, uh, forgive me, but to me, that's quite an unsatisfying way of describing it because I suppose what I'm, so I thought I imagine as part of that. Yep. And also then experience, whatever that is, physical, you know, emotional, that's all consciousness, right? Is right. It, so I think you I think you can, yeah, that's a starting point. Just, just, yeah. so that definition is, is useful partly because of what it excludes. So it's saying consciousness is not the same thing as, as intelligence, it's not the same thing as having language or of behaving in a particular way. It's just any kind of experience. But what does that, you know, what does that mean? How do you work with that? So the way I approach it is to think of like three different aspects mm. of consciousness that cover this broad idea. One of them is, is level, like what happens in the brain when you, you lose consciousness entirely, like in anesthesia or in other conditions something that affects globally how conscious you are. Then there's conscious content, which is when you are conscious, you're conscious of something. You open your eyes and, and a world is there and has colors and shapes and people and places and, and objects and things are happening. And how does that occur? Because the brain can take in information and respond to it without consciousness being involved. I mean, we, we can perceive things unconsciously not everything that, that reaches our senses we, is, uh, affects what we're aware of. So what in the brain generates the experience of a world? And then finally, what in the brain underpins the experience of the self? Because it's, it's, it's tempting to think of the self as like, you just take it for granted. It's this, it's this mini me inside my brain somewhere that is doing all the perceiving and then deciding what to do next. But the way I think, and a lot of others in this area think, is that the self is not the thing that does the perceiving. It's not something to be taken for granted. The self is another kind of perception. The brain is creating the experience of self in the same way that it's creating the experience of the world. I think dividing it this way gives, gives um, certainly that's what structures the way I do my research, I try and understand these areas. They're all joined up in some ways, but you can approach them at least a little bit separately. I feel like I'm high again. Anyway, <laughs> over to you, mate. <laughs> well, and so, if that being the case, so we all experience consciousness. Yeah. So why is our consciousness different? And how different is our consciousness, if you see what I mean? Yeah, I think this is a really, I mean, this is in fact something we're working on at the moment. Um, it's, it's very easy to assume that we all experience the world the same way because our experience has that character. You know, I open, I, I'm looking at you guys now and you're wearing a, a kind of mauve purple shirt and a, and a blue shirt. And it seems like that's out there in the world. Those colors are out there in the world. They're not being made up in my head. Um, and the same for everything else I'm experiencing. But that's not true, right? The, the way it's actually working is, of course, there's a real world out there. Of course, you guys are actually out there and there are, thing, there are these objects that you're sitting on and, and wearing. Um, but the way I or anybody or any animal would experience them is dependent partly on what's there, but to a large extent on what's, how the brain decides to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Color's a really good example. You, know, you take a piece of white paper from in here outside, and it still looks white, even though the light waves bouncing into your eyes have changed completely. The brain takes into account all the ambient lighting in order to decide what color something should be. And the same, hap the same is true for everything that we experience, which means that we're all gonna experience things differently, even though, we, even though it seems as though we each see the world just as it truly is. And sometimes these differences can be quite large. You know, sometimes people see things that other people don't. You know, they start actively hallucinating. Um, or they might have what we would call a neurodivergent condition, where it's like autism or ADHD or something. So their experience of the world is quite dramatically different in a way that can often be challenging. But I think, and there's some evidence for this now, that, that even if you don't hallucinate actively or describe yourself as neurodivergent, we all experience the world differently. In fact, there's no sort of single true way to experience it. You know, our perceptions are, are tied 
to reality. Otherwise, they would be useless. Mm -hmm. But there's but they're always a construction, and the constructions will always differ. Quite how much they differ is something that we we're looking at. We have this project called the Perception Census, which is a set of online little brain teasers and interactive experiments and illusions that is trying to map out this hidden world of of inner diversity. Because you know, I think we know in society that we've come to hopefully optimistically cherish the externally visible diversity we have in in sort of height and skin color and and so on and cultural background that we can see on the outside. Uh, and so I think recognizing and learning to to cherish the inner diversity that we have too could be equally transformational, but we just need to know what it looks like. That's such a profound point, the inner diversity, because how much of this inner diversity, Anil, is chemical, biological, whatever way you want to put it, and also how much of it is a product of our childhood experiences and our culture and what we have been taught growing up? This is a very good question, and I don't think there's going to be any single clear answer to it. We're all, you know, as individuals, this complicated mix of inheritance, you know, what's in our genes, development, how we grew up, the childhood experiences, the culture, the language we speak. Um, and just what happened to me yesterday is going to affect how I encounter the world and the self today. Teasing these things apart is very, very difficult, but there's some clues that, that can help us. So there's some classic studies about the effect of language that native Russian speakers distinguish more shades of blue. So you're a native Russian speaker. Mm. So probably, I mean, you know, like the, the light wave spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum is basically just a continuous set of, of light, of wavelengths. Yes. But, but our brains carve it up into distinct colors, which is why a rainbow has these distinct bands. It doesn't just look like a continuous band of color. Um, but that's our brains imposing these categories. And it turns out that for native Russian speakers, these categories are imposed in a slightly different way. Mm. So, Entirely useless here because the sky is always gray. The sky is always gray. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. But, but it's one example of, of how you know, language... Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought this, you know. Like, I noticed that when my wife and I, if we're speaking Russian versus when we're speaking English, I, I am speaking Russian or English to people. If I'm... Uh, I've always thought that language is identity to some extent because I am a different person when I'm speaking Russian to yeah. when I'm speaking English. I say things differently. It's almost, I almost would say I have slightly different opinions. Interesting. When, when I am in the different, I don't know if you find this for yes. Spanish. Yeah, I find it because um, I wouldn't say I'm a native Spanish speaker, but I learned Spanish at the same time I learned English. Right. But I, I feel that way when I, when I speak Spanish. I'm more demonstrative, I'm more open. And then when I speak English, I'm more kind of... I also speak, I speak Spanish, but not as well as you. I learned it as a sort of a late teenager, yeah. embarrassed about my <laughs> inability to speak anything but English. And I think, yeah, I, that resonates. I feel just much more stupid when I speak Spanish, though. <laughs> I speak it really badly. But it, it does seem to affect the thoughts. It's not just oh, the ability to express definitely. the thoughts. I start having simpler thoughts. Yeah. about where the bus station is, <laughs> like what's on the menu. Yeah. So w one of the interesting things that I've always thought, and, you know, this idea that um, perception is projection, right, essentially, to some to a large extent, that's, that's kind of a part of almost every spiritual tradition. It's part of, if you do personal development, this is the first thing they'll teach you. You know, you are projecting your crap, basically, onto the world, mm -hmm. and then you're upset at what's coming mm -hmm. back at you. So... What, what does it what does it mean? Particularly because, as you say, when we look out into the world, the world is it's an infinite amount of information. And is it the case that the reason we have we see certain things is like I am pro like right now there's a wealth of information behind you, but I'm looking at you yeah. because you're a human being, and I'm seeing certain things about you that I'm primed to receive. Um, and so we're all essentially creating our own experience for us yeah. for ourselves. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you're quite right that a lot of traditions, whether it's in, in you know, Western culture of personal development or in Eastern spiritual mm. traditions, especially Buddhism and the concept of Maya and that things are illusory in their surface appearance, there's a lot of um, a long history to thinking this way, that what we experience is a kind of projection. But what I think neuroscience is bringing to the table is Instead of this being metaphorical, it's, yes. it's unpacking it 
literally? Like, mm-hmm. how does this actually happen? How deep does it go? What does it mean in terms of some of our more basic encounters with the world? Just our experience of of shape and, and color, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not given. That's also a projection. And what's you know, literally happening, at least you know, I think, and this is the, the idea that I've been exploring in, in my work and in the book, is that the brain is a kind of prediction engine. Yes. And instead of just passively soaking up information from the world or, or the body, you know, the information that, that comes in is, is ambiguous. It's noisy. It's just this, as you say, this almost infinite morass of, of signals, whether it's electromagnetic radiation or sound waves or whatever it might be. The brain has to make sense of this to conjure a definite world, a world that just sort of clicks into position, these mm-hmm. things that we see. And so the way it does that, it has to actively interpret the information that it gets. And how does it do that? Well, here's what, here's what the theory says. The theory says that the brain is constantly throwing out predictions about the likely causes of sensory signals. Like what's most likely to be out there in the world to give rise to the information that's coming in? And then it uses the sensory information to calibrate its predictions, to update them, to tune them to the world. And what we perceive is not a readout of the signals, it's the content of the, of the predictions. So just zooming out a little bit again, what this means is our, our experiences are not just passive registrations of an objective reality. They're always active, top-down, inside-out constructions. We actively generate our worlds. And we also, I think, the same goes for the body too. You know, our emotional responses are perceptions of what's happening to the body in response to the world. Mm. I think this is this really, for me, this keeps nagging at me when even just in everyday mm. life because we walk around and it just seems as though we see the world and it's kind of we're reading it from the from the outside in and it's continually challenging counterintuitive to think that's that's not what's going on you know we're we're always you know what's out there who knows ask a physicist but the way we experience it is always coming from the inside out that's very interesting and and of course anyone who's looked into this for half a second knows it's true mm. and on the other hand i feel like that puts that makes it quite difficult to live life in a way because it's like I, I get that I'm projecting my thoughts and whatever onto reality. So how do I then navigate the world? Because like I know, for example, if I jump out of that window, I am going to hit the ground. Yep. That, like that's real, right? Yep. If I drive my car into something, that's a bad outcome for yep. me and for the car and for whatever. So how do we? How do we navigate reality then, knowing all of this? How does this uh, change the way we live life? Unfortunately, evolution has designed the way the brain constructs experience so that we don't do things like jump out of windows Mm -hmm. or drive cars into walls. I've, I've been fond of saying that our experience is like a controlled hallucination. It's a hallucination in the sense that it is generated by the brain, Mm -hmm. but it's the control is equally important. Mm. So evolution has shaped our perceptual mechanisms, our brain circuitry, Mm. so that the experiences we have are tied to the world in ways that are very useful for guiding our lives, for for survival in the broader sense of the word of the word. So this means also that we're likely to have Sub- somewhat, well, substantially similar experiences. Yes, we might experience slightly different shades of red, but unless you're like actively, frankly hallucinating, we all look out of the window and see there's a big drop. And we know that that's a bad thing to, you know, to just launch ourselves into. So I think that's, I think that's fine. I think <clears throat> that actually the novelist Anais Nin said it very well. She said, we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. Mm. And evolution has made sure that we see things as we are in a way that's usually aligned with what we need to do to survive. Of course, this is, this is a challenge in, in some respects because you know, we have technologies now where we're unable to sense some things which might be damaging to us, like radiation, for instance. We, mm. we, we just don't detect it. That's not part of our, our, our controlled hallucination. Evolution didn't shape us to be sensitive to these kinds of things. And then we might also perceive you know, other things like the the rate of change of 
carbon in the atmosphere. And we're very bad at perceiving things that unfold over time scales mm -hmm. that evolution hasn't deemed relevant to our ongoing survival. And you know, in the world in which we live, our perceptual tuning is becoming less adequate to the challenges we face, but it's still perfectly adequate to the, the here and now, to the, like the not jumping out of windows or, or running in front of buses. Isn't that the problem as well, that essentially we're all on social media and social media has been designed almost to hack our very consciousness so that we judge our success and failure in life by what is happening in this virtual world? Yeah, I think it's it's amplifies. I mean, we're we're very familiar, I think, from social media with this idea of, of social media echo chambers, right? I mean, we seek out news that confirms what we already think. There are this drives the dynamics of polarization, and we we enter this situation where it becomes very hard to to even understand that another person can have the beliefs that they have, uh, because uh, sort of the way our own beliefs has been shaped have have been rooted in in very different sources of, of information. And I think you can almost draw a parallel here with, with perception too. Yes, we have these social media echo chambers, but we also have to some extent perceptual echo chambers too. You know, we all live in different inner world, unique inner worlds, right down to the level of how we experience them. And we'll probably seek out perceptual information to reinforce the way we encounter the world, even at these, these lowest levels. How do you solve that? I, I, this is an enormous challenge, but of course, recognizing that we live in echo chambers is essential prerequisite to overcoming the problems that they pose, right? If you don't know, you live in one. If you don't know you live in a bubble, you'll never get out of it. Hey Francis, do you want to protect your privacy? Of course I do. Now that I'm an international celebrity, who's appeared on hit shows like the Joe Rogan Experience, I have to protect myself from vicious people looking to tear me down. I'm the Michael Jackson of the internet. Not the celebrity I would have gone for, but trust is important when picking a VPN. I don't trust anyone after she left me. She took everything. Francis, remember what your lawyer said. Good point. You can trust ExpressVPN because they don't sell your data to advertisers. They've even created software called Trusted Server that means they can't store any data at all. ExpressVPN uses Lightweight, a VPN protocol that makes user speeds faster than ever. ExpressVPN is now blazingly fast. You can watch HD videos with zero buffering. Thousands of pounds in legal fees. The great thing about ExpressVPN is that you don't need any technical skills to set it up, just like Francis. Fire up the app and it's one button to connect. One tap on a button was all it needed for my entire life to disintegrate. Loads of people are saying that ExpressVPN is the best VPN there is. Business Insider, The Verge and many other tech journals rate ExpressVPN as the number one VPN in the world. Go on, Francis. Protect yourself with ExpressVPN. Use our link, expressvpn.com slash trigger today and get an extra three months free on a one year package. That's expressvpn.com slash trigger. Visit expressvpn.com slash trigger to learn more. She took everything. And then therefore the question is, if we all experience reality in inverted commas subjectively, then is there any such thing as truth really? You know, people argue about the truth and this is the truth. Is there any such thing as the truth? Well, that's a very loaded term, right? I mean, it can mean different things in, in, in different contexts. Yeah. If, if you think about truth as in you know, objective reality, mm -hmm. I th I th it's true to say that we're all sitting on chairs, right? Mm -hmm. But then a physicist might come along and say, well, you know, of course a chair is just an approximation for a bunch of atoms behaving in a particular way and there's no such thing as a chair. And... Wittgenstein would come along and say the whole concept of chair is is a problem. You know, there's just this sort of vague category of chairness. Um, but for those of us who are not that clever, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we can all sorry, agree I'm we're sitting on chairs. You know what I mean? Well, so that's what I mean. I think there's you know there's a there's a level of truth which is just the, you know the right level of consensus which has you know which 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 is reinforced by by experience. So yeah, it is true that we're all sitting on chairs. I think that's fine. So the fact that we all construct our experiences doesn't mean 
that we have to get rid of the concept of truth and that nothing is true. No, mm -hmm. I don't think that's right. Yeah. I guess what I'm getting at, I'm curious, is this will be a shocking example, but like, is there a difference between us consensually agreeing that we're sitting on chairs and people in Nazi Germany agreeing that the Jews are evil? Like, is there a difference between that? Or is that just people creating this objective consensual reality based on what's going on in society? I think there's a, I think there's a massive difference. Forget morality, I'm just talking yeah. on a practical level. But I think, I think yeah, because the, the fact that we're sitting on chairs is something that can be immediately verified mm. by the fact that, you know, you, you sit down and you don't immediately fall through onto the floor. Yeah. And, and the consequences of our belief that we're sitting on a chair is just reinforced by what happens next. Mm -hmm. um, as you get further and further away from the ability to test your perceptual beliefs against reality, then they become, then they can become more and more divorced. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think you can get away. The, the, the key difference there is morality. You know, you, that idea, the idea about what, not, what people in, some people in Nazi Germany thought about Jews is a moral ethical position. Mm. And you, you, that is not something the truth of which is established, like sitting on a chair. It's, it's clearly you know, wrong anyway, but that kind of claim, even if it was uh, a morally good claim, even if it was a different kind of claim, that you know, the, the claim that you know, everybody should be free to you know, marry whoever they want or something like yeah. that, that's not something that can be verified in the same way that sitting on a chair right. can be mm. verified. So, so there is a difference. And, and since we are on the subject of politics, I suppose, the question that we end up with, you mentioned polarization. We've obviously had an awful amount of it in recent years. Um, is there any point having political discussions? It seems to be our only chance, right? I mean, one of the language is one of the most, probably the most distinctive features of the human species. I mean, we like to think as humans, we're special. Mm -hmm. And we usually think we're more special than we actually are. And the whole history of of science, I think, has been a history of of deflating this human exceptionalism and realizing that we're more continuous with with the rest of nature than was previously thought. But language, I still think, is is distinctive for humans, and it gives us so much potential in both directions. It's language that allows us to build culture, build civilization, but of course, it's language also that can be uh, can can be used to bootstrap these dynamics of polarization. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 sometimes it seems fruitless, mm -hmm. doesn't it? But, it does. But what else are you going to do? Yeah. Do you sometimes think, uh, Anil, that because, so it, early on in the year, I did a, a mushroom ceremony where I took magic mushrooms and then I took uh, a tobacco as well and I had very powerful hallucinations. And people said to me, like, oh, what was the experience of that? And the reality is, is that language isn't enough at times. Do you think that's also part of the challenge, that we are experiencing this consciousness and we have this marvellous tool that is language, but sometimes it isn't enough to adequately convey our emotions and the way that we perceive the world? I think that's absolutely right. I mean, this is why we still have a space for literature, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's something about good writing that can evoke uh, an experience, a setting, um, more than most of us are able to do with words. But I think there is still a fundamental limit. Of course, this is almost a necessary trade-off with language. We ha it has to gloss over fine distinctions in order to be useful at all. If, if I had a word, and this gets back to the fact that we might experience the world in subtly different ways, you know, without even going as far as a mushroom ceremony. Um, if there was a separate word for every possible experienceable shade of blue, then we would be using different words and we would never communicate. So it's the fact that language abstracts away from the fine details of experience. That's actually what makes it useful yes. because we can then communicate. But the trade-off is, is, as you say, language will not capture the fine grain of experiences. And there are some experiences like, like psychedelics mm. Um, that will really challenge the boundaries of what language can can achieve. But this is perhaps why you know sometimes these kinds of experiences can be quite valuable because they provide a first person sort of kick. You know, they've a first person opportunity to realise that 
the, the world we experience is a construction of the brain, that it's not just a direct window onto the way the world is. It can open a gap, I think, between our, our lived experience and how we relate to that in the same way that, that meditation can do as well, but over much longer timescales with much more practice. Do you think that's part of the problem as well, is that we all, since we all experience the world in a different way, it makes it so much more tricky to be harmonious? Because if we see things in a different way, then we're talking about two different realities, Yeah, in a sense. I mean, you remember that, that photo from a few years ago of the dress? Yeah. That was half the world saw as blue and black and, and half as yellow and, and white. And that's a great allegory for, for your point, isn't it? Because, I mean, the division over that was extraordinary and it was just a photo of a dress. But people could not understand that it was possible to see it another way because it seemed to them that they were seeing it as it really is. Mm. And so that does, you know, you, you put that in a more contentious context rather than just the color of a photo of a dress. Mm. Tax and, policy, yeah, you know, yeah. strikes, whatever. Anything. Yeah, you're, you're going to get into trouble. And um, I think that's part of the reason why this recognition about how perception works, how conscious experience works, it's not just sort of of, of mere scientific interest. It's of direct social relevance because we need to understand when you kind of bed in this understanding as widely as possible, that perception is, you know, it's dependent on us. We see things as we are and to cultivate a little bit of humility mm. about our perceptual encounters with the world, which this is me being a bit sort of optimistic and Panglossian, you know, might end up in cultivating a bit of humility also about our beliefs. And allow us to, you know, if, if, if we can get people, for instance, imagine this, imagine you have people disagreeing violently about some political issue and you get them to sit down and look at this photo of the dress and they see it different ways, but then you kind of take them through how and why they see it different ways and the fact that it's a construction and so on. You know, would that process of understanding the nuts and bolts of perspective taking, you know, would that give them a better platform for communicating about the beliefs they violently disagree about. Mm. I don't know, but you know, maybe. Well, speaking of contentious issues, I suppose one of the most obvious questions here is, well, there's two questions actually. Uh, first of all, human beings throughout our history have had some kind of belief in a supreme being or a set of supreme beings or super, whatever, you know, some version of that. Um, do you have any insight as to why we do this? Is it because we are connected to a supreme being that exists? Is it because our brain produces, you know, what can you tell us about that part, first of all? I think this is, it's, it's such a common feature of, of human culture, isn't it? Of yes. course, everybody, different cultures have their own different supreme beings. Yes. And this is, this is where <laughs> a lot of the trouble starts. <laughs> um, and, but I think you asked the right question. Why are we compelled across cultures to have some belief that, that, that fits that description. And this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but the, the intuition I have is it, it's really something to do with the fact that we, um, might be two things going on. First is perhaps another distinctive, maybe this isn't distinctive about humans, but we know we are mortal. You know, we know we will die. At least we know that in the abstract, it's very hard to actually understand what that means. Um, and in the face of that, you know, we have that conflicts with what evolution over millions and millions of years has shaped brains to do, which is to persist, to keep the body alive. And that basic kind of operating system of our, of our psychology to continue to keep on going is just incompatible with the knowledge that at some point we don't. Mm. And to resolve that, that contradiction, you know, we need something. And one of the things that, that comes up is, um, is a supreme being. I think the other interesting idea about this, and this is not my idea at all, I can't remember where I, where I first read this, was that the concept of, of a God or a supreme being came about as human society um, 
changed in ways that groups of the groups of people living together got stronger and stronger, got bigger and bigger rather. So that in order to um, to reinforce the the hierarchies to allow larger groups of people to to keep on to keep going together without sort of dissolving into conflict. These are the shared myths of your Nova Ferrari, for example. This is yeah, that, that's situation. probably it. I mean, and I, I don't think it's very hard to find any evidence for that, but you, you know, some appeal to something beyond a single individual human seems in principle that can reinforce hierarchies very, very strongly. I don't know whether it's true. I, I tend to think it's the, it's this distinction, but it's this tension between knowledge of our mortality and the deeply baked in drive to stay alive mm. that's at the heart of it. And as the qu second question that's interesting to me is whether it's psychedelics, mm. whether it's spiritual experiences that I've had, uh, what, talking to other people about certain things, I, I got the sense very strongly that when people experience that freedom of this constant brain processing, the immediate surroundings and whatever, quite often they all have the experience of ultimate connection with other people and the, the universe, whatever that is. Do we have any thoughts on, on whether that, where that comes from? I think so, yeah. I think this is something where neuroscience might shed a bit of light on because it, it, it goes back to earlier part of our conversation about what is the self. Now, mm -hmm. the idea, there's the, the sort of immediately superficially appealing idea that the self is this immutable essence of you or me that's just there and, and might survive after death or whatever, um, compared to this other view of the self that it's, it's a perception, that it's, it's a construction of the brain and, um, and might change over time as well. I mean, the way we experience being a self is not fixed. It does evolve, even though we don't necessarily perceive it evolving. And if it's a construction of the brain, it, it can also be tuned down or even go away. And there's this concept from meditation, from some psychedelics research as well, from some spiritual traditions about ego dissolution. Mm. Mm. And I think, again, this is not necessarily a metaphorical thing. It, it can be quite grounded in a, a way of conscious experience happening in which the experience of self is either absent or at least um, attenuated to a great degree. One of the things the brain does I think when in, in normal everyday life, at least for people in, in our culture, is it's always um, establishing distinctions between self and other, whether it's other people or the rest of the world. Now, these distinctions are not, not complete and, and they're very fluid. Like part of what it means to be me is how I experience myself refracted through the minds of others. You know, there's, there's part of me is really residing in, in the minds of my, my friends and colleagues and so mm -hmm. on. Um, but you know, at the same time, I see this hand in front of me. I know that's my hand. Those hands are not, this chair is not part of my body. There are some aspects of the construction of self, which, which impose a relatively clear distinction, but those distinctions you know, can be done away with. It doesn't mean they go away in the real world. Like my body is still separate from the chair, but the brain might in some, in some states, it might not draw these distinctions in perception. And that could be what's going on that underlies this experience of connectedness. And in fact, if you look inside the brains of people on, on high doses of psychedelics, you see things compatible with that idea. You see sort of more mixing of the brain circuits, whereas typically there's sort of, there's parts of the brain that are more associated with self. And when they're active, other parts of the brain more associated with experience of the world, you know, they, they tend to be largely separable, but under psychedelics, everything gets a bit mushed together. Mm. So, so it's when, when the self, the self is reduced in so prominence, that's when our ability to connect with other things becomes stronger, essentially. Is that? Well, I think that's when we have the, I think there's a difference here between ability and experience. Yes. So there's this, we enter a state where we suddenly feel more connected with other people, with the universe in general, with the stars, with the trees, with the grass and so on. Um, but if experience is partly projection, I would imagine then in that state, you're much more likely to behave with other people in a way that makes it easier to connect. I mean, I know this experientially, like the less self, the more I can, we can, we can connect. Maybe. I think it might, it might be a sort of a balancing act, right? I think if you, 
if you're in a total state of ego dissolution, then then the concept of interaction becomes a bit pointless, pointless <laughs> because there's no you anymore at all. That's so right. it's about finding the balance. And I think the the value of of transient experiences of of things like ego dissolution is that when you come back out of the other side, you relate to your everyday self and therefore others in a bit of a different way. But it's still you know, it's still back. So we we talk about hallucinations, and in a sense, this is a hallucination. There's, um, well, we all know him, the music producer Pharrell, who says that he sees music. Certain notes have yeah. certain colours. And what does that mean then in terms of the of hallucinations, in terms of creativity? Do Are creative people, as the, the, the saying goes, like they're more volatile, they're more passionate, do, is that such a thing? Do they tend to feel things more deeply? Do they tend to see a different type of hallucination? I think it's very hard to pin down what the secret source of creativity is. You know, people can be creative in all sorts of different ways. But there are, you know, in individual cases, I think you can see that specific and interestingly different ways of experiencing the world can be a spark that fuels one person's creativity. I mean, the mm. phenomenon you're describing there is called synesthesia, mm. which is super interesting. It's like a, broadly speaking, it's a mixing of the senses. And for most of us, vision and hearing, you know, they're, they're separate, right? If I hear a sound, it might conjure up a particular image in my mind, but I don't literally see things. But in synesthesia, the connection is much more clo is much closer and people indeed Different notes can evoke experiences of particular colors. Um, that's one form of synesthesia. Tastes can have shapes. There are many forms of mixing the senses. I mean, even for us, even for non-synesthetes, the senses mix in some ways. Like this is what we call metaphor. You know, some notes are high, others are low. And, and um, taste is sharp or, or dull. I mean, we, we, we don't, you know, we encounter our world as a, as a, mixture of senses anyway, but for synesthesia, it's, it's like more direct. Mm. And there's good examples of, of musicians, of painters, K Kandinsky was a synesthete, the, the novelist Vladimir Nabokov who wrote Lolita was a synesthete. And this is understandable, right? You have a different way of encountering the world mm. that, that can provide associations that other people don't have. And that being the case, at what point does these types of conditions go into something like mental illness with schizophrenia where people are seeing things or perceiving the world in ways which are just completely have no bearing on reality. So this, this like gets back to this idea of perceptual diversity mm -hmm. and this, this continuum or spectrum that we might think of. And, um, most of us live in the middle bit, you know, just as most of us are between, I don't know, like uh, nearly five feet and six feet or whatever of height. You know, most of us will see the world in, in different ways, but in ways which is still well adapted to what's really out there and sufficiently similar that we can communicate. But you know, as you go further off that, then you get into the territory where you might start to ascribe people either with something like a neurodivergent condition mm -hmm. or with something like a, a mental illness. Um, but the key point here is that the fact that you experience the world differently does not in itself mean that there's a, a deficit or that there's a particular condition or that there's a mental illness going on. You know, that's something that happens when the, your way of seeing something poses challenges for the environment you live in. Like even something like schizophrenia, which is very, very distressing for people that experience it, you know, you hear voices in your head that are instructing you to do things. Often it's a lot of auditory hallucinations. You feel dissociated from yourself. You know, in some cultures, these, uh, these experiences were sort of celebrated as somebody, you know, channeling some spiritual energy rather than being thought of as, as mentally ill. Uh, and hopefully the, the recognition that we all construct our experiences, we all differ in some ways, gives us greater empathy for people who are mentally ill in one way or another. Um, that's at least you know, the hope. And also just, sorry, one other point on this is that there's plenty of people who hallucinate 
who are on you know out of that middle range who aren't mentally ill and there's a hearing voices for instance is actually quite common for people i can't i don't, i'm not sure what the st statistics are i have a, a colleague charles fernihoff in durham who's led this um project called the hearing voices project to understand like how widespread it is um because for most people if they hear a voice in their head you know they there's a great taboo against talking about it because you don't want to be labeled as as suffering psychosis or as mad or mentally ill it's only a problem when these voices become a problem in virtue of what they're saying for some people they're just the kind of benign if they're saying go to the gym <laughs> like that's fine yeah exactly yeah. and visual hallucination is the same some people see things but it's not always distressing or problematic so the range of altered experiences i think is much much broader much richer than we typically think so i find that very interesting because i have adhd and i remember when i got diagnosed with it i entered not a period of mourning is a strong way to put it but almost a week of just sadness really when I, when i received the diagnosis and then it's a, it's a process of understanding with myself in that the way i see the world in the way that i move through the world is very different to the way other people do and as a result it's not just an acceptance of myself but it's also how can i put this a journey to try and understand other people so that we can meet halfway do you see what i mean yeah 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 and and i think that's a really important way of looking at it because if you just go down the path of well this is me the world needs to change around me the world is never going to do that right and you have to accept that but if you find a way for you to so to be able to exist more cohesively with the world i think that's how you get again a greater sense of acceptance do you see what i mean yeah and i think i think the bar should be higher than acceptance as well and here yeah. you know i come to this metaphor of biodiversity like in in ecosystems we are we're just aware that having lots of different kinds of plants and animals is a good thing for a flourishing ecosystem you don't want a monoculture and i think exactly the same is true for human cultures and whether this is diversity on the outside again skin color and whatever but especially diverse than the inside it's not that yeah, we Yeah I think that's much more important actually yeah. personally. Yeah and you want to get to a point where differences in the way we encounter the world are not merely accommodated but enrich society. Mm. Well if you think about the fact I mean Francis talks about ADHD most comedians have come out as having ADHD in the last year just for some reason but it mm -hmm. kind of makes sense like if you, Francis is brilliant when we do our live streams at like making random jumps from th one thing to another I imagine the ADHD is part of that and there'll be other conditions that fuel other forms of creativity and and whatever they're not maybe even a condition there's just a way of a different way of being in the world uh which has trade-offs right as all ways of being uh do hey francis what is the best way to advertise a business oh that's easy all you need to do is spend tons of cash on a radio advert that advert is guaranteed to be heard by people who are completely disengaged and not even properly listening then simply sit back and watch all your hard-earned money go up in flames hmm. what about advertising with trigonometry why would i do that when i can advertise on gimp fm for the measly sum of 30000 pounds and generate precisely zero sales because trigonometry now has nearly a million subscribers across all platforms in january alone we generated over 12 and a half million views and downloads that's right you can buy an ad with us and we'll promote your business on one of our incredible episodes we'll match your brand with the most suitable episode that way you know it has every chance of being a success plus your advert will be written by two professional comedians that's right we're hiring two professional comedians we pride ourselves on making our ads funny and engaging to the point that some people say they're their favorite part of the show yeah we probably shouldn't admit that mate yeah you're right all you need to do is contact us on marketing at triggerpod.co.uk that's marketing at triggerpod.co.uk advertise with us and we will get your business noticed by the most problematic people on planet earth so i i'm curious to come back to to the political side of of the conversation because i'm just wondering you know how because on the one hand you could say well look people have their own version of reality and 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 that's just what it is and that's fine but yet we do go through like 
periods, don't we? You know, you have Thatcher and there's a particular way of seeing the world. And then you have, you know, Blair and there's a particular way of seeing the world. And then you have the current government. And there are philosophical and political ways of looking at the world that change over time. Uh, and at the same time, you know, if you read more about history, actually the, the political battle between the sort of more lefty, more compassion, more empathy, but perhaps slightly less uh, of the rationality and pragmatism versus the overly rational, overly pragmatic, lacking in empathy. That's been going on since since forever, right? So how do we how do we navigate the political world? I mean, like you know, I'm doing question time uh, tomorrow. Is there any point in me saying anything? Well, this is you. You asked earlier about what's the value of political conversation. I think you know, make, p making these points is exactly is, is what's needed. I mean, there are some currents, as you say, that that have just almost always been there. Some tensions between individualism and collectivism yes. in politics, yeah. very very broadly, and um, the pendulum the pendulum swings and the pendulum swings for, for all sorts of reasons. Right, partly because people tend to react against the status quo. People yes. have short mm. short memories. Yes. Um, People always are attracted to change um, for change's sake often. Mm -hmm. So th this, this sets up you know, a dynamic where it's very hard to retain a stability. And it looks like you know, we're, we're leaving one period and maybe entering another period. Now, after whatever, 12 years of you know, Western politics seems to have this kind of, this kind of cycle. Um, and I think what's really helpful is trying to get under, you probably can't stop that from happening. But, you know, nonetheless, there might be some shared core beliefs that that can be built on. And what I really personally find troubling about politics is this kind of tit for tat responsive yes. thing rather than the, the inability to build on previous uh, positions, previous sort of political eras in a way that's cumulative, even if it might not seem like it, because you know, whether you're on the left or the right, in England, for instance, or the UK, you probably still have some core beliefs about access to healthcare and so on. People should have some. And what, why can't we still find those areas of consensus and, and build on them without too much just doing something and then undoing it and doing something else and then undoing it and going back and forth? Well, it seems like that's happening because we're all too attached to the idea that our particular interpretation of reality is the one true thing. And anyone who disagrees with it is a heretic and must be, you know, cancelled, destroyed, evil, whatever, you know. That, that seems to me to be quite a big part of it, probably driven by social media to a large extent. Uh, although I imagine, you know, political debate has always been fraught and, and uh, sometimes violent, actually. Right. I mean, it's getting a lot more peaceful than it has done over yeah. history. And I think there's people like Stephen Pinker who mm. do quite a good job of pointing yeah. out, you know, in fact, there are a lot of things that are getting better, even though it really doesn't seem like it. And again, partly because of how the media's attention works and things that change slowly don't tend to get much much focus. Things that change quickly and dramatically do tend to get focus. And I think in the same in the same way, the differences between positions tend to attract attention rather than the commonalities um, between positions. And you know, one of the things that I've been quite surprised at as I've gotten older is is actually the consensus between different political parties on things because mm. you just don't hear about it in the media, and you tend to assume that that everything is, is treated differently, but that's not always the case. That is a really interesting point. And of course, you're right that people uh, want change often for the sake of it. I remember, um, I can't remember who it was, but there was a period when there was quite a lot of uh, agreement and concordance between the positions of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. And what happened? You get people from the left like George Galloway and people from the right like Nigel Farage coming along and saying, well, it's Tweedledee and Tweedledum. There is no, there's no difference between the two cheeks of the same backside. And people are clamoring then for a new way of doing things when there is that consensus. So I guess this is kind of the human condition, isn't it? We go around in these circles. Yeah, and I think you see this especially now with the rise of, of identity politics. You know, mm. people needing to to have almost as an extension of their experience of self. You know, the the you have the body, you have the perspective, sense of will, you have your social network, and then you know you need a, a political self too. And you know, th this is again something that can be valuable because it can serve to to highlight underrepresented groups. This is a valuable thing, but taken again, taken too far, it becomes 
just a bit a bit pointless really because it, again it emphasizes the differences rather than the commonalities you're disconnecting and, yourself from other people yeah 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 so what role does hormones or do hormones play in this in the need for tri- to become part of the tribe in the need to you know have a group and also have an enemy which was which is literally hardwired into us it's a survival mechanism I th- it's a really good question. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know enough about what happens you know, in the brain that shapes uh, social affiliations. I mean, clearly, clearly there's something, whether it's a football team, whether it's a group of friends, whether it's a political party. Our minds do work like this. And it's not only human minds. I mean, it's, it's many other species. Social creatures in general you know, are very, very um, bound to this dynamic of, of social affiliation. Um, Hormones, emotional responses are clearly very, very important in this, and, and they're important in general. I think this, this just more generally highlights something that's still incompletely understood and, and lacking when we think when and people talk about the brain as some kind of computer often, and and there's still this this um, hangover from I think philosophers like Descartes and the Enlightenment who who emphasise rationality mm. as the sort of ideal of, of, of human mind and what set us apart from, from other animals. But our rationality is completely dependent on, on our emotional responses too. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of examples of that, of people who, who lack emotional responses and they don't, they don't make good decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, we need emotional responses to be practically rational. Um, People like Antonio Damasio in my field have been writing about this for decades, and it's it's abundantly true. And not taking into account the emotional um, responses of people is is a big mistake in whatever sphere you're in. And even if you're trying to understand the brain as a neuroscientist, you know we have to think about the way. I think the way we experience anything is fundamentally grounded in our body's response to the situation. Our nature as living creatures is fundamentally important to our experiences of the world and the self. Um, And then back out into the realm of society and and politics, there's obviously a play on people's emotions to drive these dynamics of polarization, but this is often disguised, right? It's often presented in the guise of, of a rational argument. But really what's going on is, is a play on, on emotions and emotions of, of tribalism often. Mm. Because you talk about, you know, it's important to have emotion, but if you are too emotional, you can't be rational either. If you are someone who feels emotions very intensely, then you get blinded by your emotion. We'll see. I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's, this is, again, something we want to look at a bit with this perception census to try and understand how all these different parts of the puzzle fit together clearly at the extremes i think you're right you know if you're just if you're just washed over by by massive waves of emotion breaking on you all the time you're not going to be able to do very much so like most things it, it, it's a balance but downplaying or, or failing to recognize the way in which emotion structures our thought mm. is is a big mistake and we shouldn't aspire to get rid of this emotional response right i think that's another mistake people often think that I would make better decisions or I'd be more rational or be more effective if I could suppress my emotional reactions to a situation and really think it through. And that's just, I don't think the evidence bears that out at all. And in fact, it's not what people in practice end up doing. You, most people always go with their gut reaction. And what's a gut reaction? Well, that's, that's a recognition of the emotional contribution. Is there not a difference between like what you're talking about, which is intuition and like, oh, I'm afraid and therefore I must do this or, oh, I'm angry and I must do this or I'm, I don't know, horny and I must, do, do you know what I mean? Like, isn't, is there not a difference between intuition uh, and my wife is very into this mm-hmm. uh, as a lot of women are uh, and uh, a, 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 like a, an emotional reaction. Is there not a, a difference between those two? Okay, maybe, but also I think the reliance on intuition is, is definitely not gender specific, right? I mean, I think my wife would disagree, but that, that is her right. <laughs> um, yeah, there's 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 a difference in in type, but I'm not sure there's a really fundamental difference. Um, 
What does that mean? An emo- well, an intuition to me is still an emotion. It's just an emotion that is, it has a less, maybe a less immediate target and it may, may unfold over a longer time scale. Mm. But it's still, it's still like a, a perception about something, you know, this is good, this is bad, that is shaped in a large part by the brain's response to the body. Mm. Um, and an emotion of fear and anger is more transient, one would hope anyway, and more directly <laughs> um, associated with a specific thing. I'm afraid of X, I, you know, I'm, and, uh, and so its contours may be more easily definable. But essentially, my intuition about this is how I describe it, because again, I honestly, I, I don't think there's a, there's a fact of the matter, mm. but the way it appears to me is that intuition and, and fear and, um, uh, are just different. They're, they're part of the same spectrum. And that spectrum is spectrum of how the brain interprets a situation based on perceiving its body's response to that situation. It's interesting you say that because experientially, I would very strongly disagree with that. Like for me, in, I've got a very powerful intuition as well that I've used for to achieve a lot of the things that I've been able to achieve in life. And to me, it's very, it's literally the opposite of emotion. If I'm emotional about something, I'm almost certain to do the wrong thing. Whereas intuitively, if I, if I have a, a calmer space to experience that sense, that's when I get the good stuff, Okay. the good advice. And my wife, likewise, and I know other people also who I've talked about this that also have, like, to me, intuition is a deep knowing and emotion is a, is a reactive force that is often destructive. Right. I mean, we might just be using the words in slightly different ways probably. back to the problem with, yeah, with the language. Problem with language yeah. That, that you know, a deep knowing, um, that, that, that makes sense to me in some ways, but what I would still like to suggest is that deep knowing is not sort of just a, an aspect of disembodied rationality. Oh, that's no, 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 it's nothing that, to do with rationality. That's grounded in oh, the body too. God, no, that's, no. that's like, that's grounded. It's definitely not rationality response. because knowing is not rational. Knowing right. is knowledge. It's, it, it, there's no rationality to it. It's just like, you must do this or, or you, this, yeah. this would be the right thing to do. Yeah. I mean, situation. I think there's also something interesting about intuition is that, and this isn't me thinking about it off the top of my head now, but an, intuition has a kind of opacity to it, right? If you can explain why you've come to a particular decision, then it's no longer intuition. Correct. Mm. Um, intuition depends on an inability to unpack it into sort of finer grained elements. Um, and that may not apply so much to, you know, if I'm angry and I do something, then it's a pretty transparent causal link, right? You know, I was angry, so I did it. Although even in these cases, you know, we may, we may misattribute things. Mm -hmm. We may do things because we think we were angry, but in fact, there's other reasons. There's all sorts of old ethically dubious psychology experiments from the 60s and 70s where people were manipulating people's emotional responses in particular ways. Tell us about that. There's one, I get a classic one. I mean, I'm not sure it totally illustrates the point. The classic one is um, an experiment by um, Dutton and Aaron, two, two psychologists in California in, or in Canada, Western Canada, actually, in the 1970s. And they were trying to make the point that um, the emotion we experience is going to be, it's the, it's, it's the brain's interpretation of what's happening in the body. And so what they did was they got a bunch of students to walk over a bridge. And this was kind of a, a scary bridge. It was like a, this sort of little rope bridge, like Indiana Jones, high above a, um, a, a raging torrent. And so it would get the adrenaline going. You know, the body would be put in, in a particular um, state. And at the end of the bridge, there would be, there was all male students. And at the end of the bridge, there was an attractive female researcher who got them to fill out a questionnaire. And at the end of the questionnaire, and the questionnaire was, I can't remember what it was, but that was sort of irrelevant. But at the end of it, there was a, you know, she would say, if you have any further questions about the study, here's my number, give me a call. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And so there are a bunch of students who went over that bridge. There was another bunch of students that went over a, a, like a much less scary bridge, a mm -hmm. um, couple of feet above the river, nice, stable, same thing. And so what happened was the students that went over the scary bridge, of course, a lot of them called, uh, called the number um, and asked the, the girl out for a date. And 
the interpretation of this experiment was that the the guys on the rickety bridge were misinterpreting their physiological arousal caused by the scariness of the bridge as a, an attraction with the with the girl and that so they were they were yeah that the, they'd been encouraged to misinterpret the state that their body was in mm -hmm. as being something else so that for me is kind of interesting because it, it reveals that it's the emotion that we have is not just a reflection of the state the body is in but it's 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 deeply shaped by the context the overall context that we understand the body state to be in as well and that can you know that that's a misinterpretation right the reason the the person was in that state of physiological arousal was because of the bridge not because of the girl mm. which brings uh I could to sort of start heading towards the end of the interview, but you mentioned the arousal and, and to take us slightly deeper than that. What is love? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have, I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I have some idea, but I have, I have like in terms of, in terms of what's happened, I mean, is it, is it a particularly human thing? That's one, one question. Mm. I'm not sure, but it, it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, there's something, there's something very perplexing about it because there's something almost counterintuitive about the depth, the psychological depth that that emotion can have, you know, the selflessness that it can mm -hmm. bring about, whether it's love of a, another person, a partner, you know, or a love of a country, you know, it, it can lead to the behavior, which on the face of it is just a bit perplexing. On the other hand, you know, it is, it's what makes life worth living. And it's the most rewarding experience that is possible to have. Quite why our human psychological architecture has such a special place for it, I think is, is a bit mysterious. Clearly it's got something to do with the fact that we, we generally pair bond and we need to bring up kids and so on. And, and you need some psychological anchor to stop new parents drifting apart and the kids fending for themselves and so on. Um, so there's, I think there is, there is probably quite good evolutionary uh, reason why we have this experience, but quite what it is and quite why it's so different from other experiences. That's, that's extraordinary. Mm. I don't have a good answer, but I'm glad it exists. <laughs> <laughs> Anil, it has been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for coming on. Before we do our questions for locals, which only they get to see, we always end on the same question, which is, What's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? We've already talked about the one, one of these things, which in this interview, which is the fact that we see the world differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think most people assume that's not the case. The implications of that are very important. The thing we haven't talked about much today um, that maybe fits into the, the various arc of the topics we've covered is, is death. Mm. Um, we all die. Um, until now, this has been one of the great equalizing forces in society. One of the things I worry about enormously is that that may change and that um, with the amount of investment going into life extension companies and things like that, it may soon be the case that people at one end of the, the spectrum not only have a lot more money during their lifetimes, but have a lot more lifetime as well. I think that would be incredibly disruptive for society. But it's I, already true, by the way, to a large extent. I mean, if you're wealthy, true. you probably live about 10, 15 years longer. So yeah, yeah. But I mean, to me, that's still, that's, that's a minor difference. You I think mean, it's going to be 50 years? 50, 100, something like that. 100. I mean, the potential, we don't know, right? But there's, 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 that could happen. Right. If you want to invest in trigonometry, <laughs> I want to live, well, I don't want to live forever, but an extra 100 years, I'd settle for. But, 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 but so that's something I think. Yeah we need to take seriously the, the possibility of something like that happening. And what, is the, what are the disruptive con consequences that you, you fear? Well, then you just get this entrenched, you know, the set of interests that, that is common among all people becomes smaller, right? You know, society depends on some common process that applies to all of us. And if you have some people who are living a hell of a lot longer, their interests diverge a lot more from people who don't have access to that. You go back to a real aristocracy and, and the peasants. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty dystopian situation. Um, just accompanying that though, I think in, even in the current world in which we live, where we do 
all die. There's so little focus on that as, as part of life. And I think we, we neglect the end of life in a way that's, that's really unfortunate for, for society, but for each of us as individuals as well. We started talking a little bit about anesthesia um, in a definition of consciousness, anesthesia being its absence. So anyone who's had anesthesia kind of has a little premonition of what it's like to, to be dead. You don't exist. And I, I read a wonderful book, a novel by Julian Barnes. The title is Nothing to be Frightened of. And I think he means that in two ways. You know, we're all frightened of oblivion, but then oblivion really is nothing. There's nothing going on. And we were not, we're not worried about all the time we didn't exist before we were born, but we are worried about the time afterwards. And um, coming to terms with, with mortality is something that I think is necessary and I think is something that is within grasp because a deeper understanding of, of the self, that it keeps changing, that there isn't an unchanging, immutable essence of you to cling on to, can give us a greater accommodation with the prospect of, of not existing. And when we reach that, that accommodation, I think that enhances the use we make of the days we do have. Mm. Anil, it's been a, a wonderful interview. If people uh, want to find you online, if they want to buy your book, where's the best place to do that? Easiest place to find me is my website, which is www.anilseth.com. And the book being you, New Science of Consciousness, pretty much everywhere, I would It hope. is everywhere, even in airports and everywhere. You've done really well, man. <laughs> Thank you. And, and if anyone is keen to help us with this research into perceptual diversity, um, please take part in the Perception Census. And you can find that again on my website um, or on dreammachine.perceptioncensus.world. But that's a bit complicated. Just look at my website. Anil, thanks for coming on. Thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you with another brilliant interview like this one or Raw Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. See you on Locals for the bonus questions. Take care. Do we have free will? This is a very good question. <laughs>